we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited, and these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Yes, so giants, this is one of those very strange subjects. I'll just put Frank down. Um, something I've been interested in since uh, looking and researching megalithic sites all around the planet. Um, and uh, I've, uh, next, please. And, um, and so I've been researching earth grids, megalithic sites, giants. There's so many things to get into once you start becoming a megalithomaniac. I was over in Australia in 2014. Um, I did some research there with Stephen Evan Strong uh, and my friend Stuart Mason, who's an archaeo astronomer, and we were looking at sites. I also went to Tonga as well, and there's been giant accounts on that island as well. Uh, one of the shows I've been involved with is called Search for the Lost Giants. Now, this is something that my friend, my, my now co author, Jim Vieira, uh, uh, manifested on the History Channel. We were researching our book, Giants on Record. And the History Channel approached Jim and said, look, we should do a show about this. It's a strange subject. It's an unusual thing to do. Um, searching for giants in North America in the ancient mounds and buried deep under the ground. It was a sort of underground success. Uh, we had like a million views per episode. And I think you can catch it online on various websites. So I do recommend you take a look if you're interested in the North American giants, which is something we're going to be focusing on today. We do have a few clips for you as well during the lecture from the show, which point out some very important aspects of this whole very strange giant phenomenon. One of the big problems uh, you'll find around the world, all over the Internet, um, are images that have been created in Photoshop and unfortunately most of these are not real. All the ones you can see on the screen now are famous photographs. You find them in books now, in magazines, um, all over the internet, on, even in some semi-academic articles claiming these are real. Just people who haven't done their research basically. So this is one of the big problems we've faced. The images you can see here actually come from a Photoshop competition on the worth1000.com website from 2002. And it was actually an archaeological competition who could create the best giant in Photoshop. So we have professionals doing it um, and putting them out on the internet. So this has become one of the banes of the giant researcher or the giantologists, as we started to call ourselves, sort of tongue in cheek recently. Um, but all around the world, we have legends of these giant skeletons and, and giant myths. In England, um, we have um, many different stories, but the Bible is probably the most amazing place where you find these accounts. Um, you have, obviously here we have um, Goliath uh, being defeated by David. We have King Og's bed on the right. Uh, we've done some research into the Bible lands, and indeed there are giant skeletons that have been found there, but there are literally over a hundred accounts. Matter of fact, explanations of the Amorites, the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Canaanites, all being actual live giants in biblical times, going back two to 4,000 years. In England, we have the... Um, the wonderful stories of Jack the Giant Killer, or Jack and the Beanstalk, which is a later story adapted from Jack the Giant Killer. And you, you may have seen the movie. Um, that's basically been adapted and included Jack and the Beanstalk. And the original stories of 
Jet the Giant Killer were quite violent and, and uh, bloodthirsty. And people don't realize this, but these go way back. These go back potentially thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and even the founding of Britain by Brutus, who came over from Troy, he met a giant on the south coast called Gog Magog and had to battle with him to the death and threw him off the coast into the sea. And these were the last remnants of the giants of Britain were destroyed by Brutus and his army. And so even in Britain, the founding of this country is based upon giants. Um, and so this is kind of one of the remarkable things we find in many countries, the foundation myths, the early stories, the oral history, the native folklore, the Aboriginal folklore, of course, uh, we find these stories literally all over the world. All across Europe, uh, we find we found actual accounts of skeletons and bones. And if you look on this map here, this just shows you some examples. Obviously, the, we've got more in Britain than we have in the rest of Europe, but you can see that they're evenly spaced. They're all over the place. They're not just in one area. And the, the general rule of giantology is that we're looking for anything over seven foot tall. That is, that is what we class as a giant. It's not really a huge giant, but this is what we've found. If you actually met a seven foot tall person and stood next to them, they would appear a giant, even if you're six foot tall. Um, but we found accounts in North America that go double that size. And we've got reports throughout Europe and even near where I am in the southwest of England that reach 13 feet tall, some even 14 feet. So it gets a bit crazy the more you look into this. Um, this is my hometown area. I grew up in a town called Cambridge, which is the famous university town in England, uh, a place called the War Ditches, which is ju just up on the, funnily enough, the Gog Magog Hills, um, we find uh, that there's actual legends and stories of giants that used to live within the hills. There's the giant's grave, which is a natural spring, which is just down um, from the hills. This is I used to walk walk this route every day to school, literally every day. The pub, uh, the public house, the ale house is called um, uh, Robin Hood and Little John. Uh, Little John was Robin Hood's giant sidekick. And so we have all these giant references even in my hometown of Cambridge, just southeast of Cambridge, in fact, in a village called Cherry Hinton. Um, and, and then in the 1800s, in 1854, a discreet article in a local newspaper actually reported on giant skeletons being found on the hills. And so, and I quote, remains of men who reached to a greater height than ordinary men in the present day were found up there. Uh, there were nine skeletons, and three of those uh, were remarkably large. Even at Stonehenge, uh, the original name of Stonehenge is called the Giant's Dance. It's not Stonehenge, it's a later Saxon name. And the image you're seeing here is the earliest depiction of Stonehenge. This goes back to at least, uh, originally it was illustrated in the 1100s, but it wasn't really published until later. It was in private kind of hands. Uh, about the 1300s it was published. And this was based on the history of the kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, and this is um, uh, an illustration by a gentleman called Wace. And you can see here on the right is the giant, he's lifting the lintel into place. Most books and internet sites claim that that is actually Merlin lifting the stone, but it's not, because Merlin is known um, to have employed the giants to build these particular sites, especially Stonehenge, and he's actually the one on the bottom left there, uh, instructing the giant what to do. According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, the rocks of Stonehenge <clears throat> were healing rocks and giants brought them from Africa to Ireland, um, a, a place called Killaroos, where they constructed the giant's dance. Later on, when Aurelius Ambrosius, who was uh, an ancient king of the Britons, he sent Merlin to retrieve the rocks, battle with the Irish, and giants brought them over to England and constructed Stonehenge in honour of this great king. And this is where the name The Giant's Dance came from, uh, the fact that Merlin was involved in this. So we've got some very interesting stories about movements of stones. There's even some stories, some of the early accounts, say he levitated and effortlessly moved the stones from one area to another. And we know Merlin was a wizard, of course. He's got many different um, aspects to his uh, skills and personality. Uh, but what's interesting is that an area in South Wales, which used to be part of Ireland, strangely, called the Priscilla Mountains, is where some of the stones actually came from. 
in Stonehenge and in the surrounding landscape around Stonehenge. And so there could be a suggestion that so-called Merlin or someone of his, with his powers moved them from that area and it wasn't in fact Ireland. So we do actually have um, accounts. I mean, this isn't an actual photo or anything like that, but this is, a, um, this is actually um, an account here. Just, I've just, I, haven't got, I haven't found the original source of this, but my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Maria Wheatley, told me this was a, a valid account. Uh, a huge skull was stated to exist in our local church um, over a hundred years ago. It was reported, and it was sitting in the front entrance of the church for many, many years. Uh, and it was it was noted by uh, famous antiquarian John Aubrey, and it would have belonged to someone eight to nine feet tall. And so, this is just one example of some of the actual giants fitting in with the legends around Stonehenge. This is just down the road from Stonehenge. This is uh, from 1830. Uh, originally, but it was originally reported in 1719. This is what 10, 10 miles from Stonehenge. This is within the Stonehenge landscape, um, and I actually visited this site yesterday uh, to go and see if there was anything left there. And uh, and there was a giant's grave mound, which is what many of the mounds are called in Britain, and and often megalithic sites as well are called giant's graves. And um, and in fact, a nine foot four skeleton was discovered there in the vicinity of Stonehenge. And so not many people realize this, that many of these megalithic sites, these famous sites we have in Britain and around the world often have giant skeletons found nearby. But this is part of the great cover up that we'll get into later. We even have this. Uh, this was another one found near Salisbury uh, by um, uh, Sir Thomas Elliot recorded at some place near Salisbury, a skeleton which measured 14 feet, 10 inches in length. So that's nearly 15 feet. This is outrageously tall. If this is for real, I would like to see the skeleton. Um, this would be utterly mind-blowing. But this is what we're researching now. Jim Vieira and I uh, are working on our next book uh, called um, The Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain. And, and what we've come up with so far is quite remarkable. It almost matches what we found in North America. This is, again, this is another mound in the Stonehenge landscape uh, reported in 1813. Not much information apart from a skeleton of large dimensions was found in a remarkable barrow. Which one that is, we don't know, but I've been working with a local researcher called Simon Banton, and we think we know which mound it is, so we're going to dig into the records here and see if we can actually find um, the actual skeleton itself. Again, we have a seven-foot skeleton unearthed near Stonehenge in 1825. Next. And Glastonbury, where I've been living for a very long time, um, uh, actually I've just very recently, I didn't tell Duncan this, I've very recently moved to Stone, near Stonehenge. I'm living right next to Stonehenge now. Um, I can't keep away from those stones and giants, apparently. Uh, but, but this is very interesting because even Glastonbury, the founding of Glastonbury, has a giant story associated with it. And this, this absolutely blew my mind. The famous uh, King Arthur's grave in Guinevere was supposed to have been found within Glastonbury Abbey in the 1100s. Um, there was a dream by one of the uh, people, one of, the, one of the, the monks at Glastonbury Abbey, that there were some pyramids under the ground, and in between these pyramids was the grave of King Arthur. So they, they did this whole thing, and they dug down there. This, remember, this is back you know, over a 1,000 years ago, or nearly a 1,000 years ago. They unearthed a massive oak trunk, buried 16 feet, um, and also they discovered a human skeleton which was of massive proportions, and the space between the eye sockets was as wide as the palm of a man's hand. And so this is incredibly large. It was inside an oak coffin, which is a classic kind of ancient Celtic burial tradition, and, uh, and a standard-sized uh, female skeleton was found there as well. But just above that, a few feet above that, when they were digging, they found this lead cross, um, which basically uh, translates as, here lies interred the famous King Arthur on the Isle of Avalon. However, the problem with this is, is that they think that could be a fake. But I found uh, through my research and Jim research as well, we found evidence that indeed the original discovery did describe an over nine foot tall giant in Glastonbury. But this map here we've got, this just shows you Europe again and shows you the spread. We're going to jump over to Ireland for a little while. And this is one example here in the Boyne Valley area of Newgrange. Um, and now and Douth. We also have a site called Fornox, and this is a very famous site, which is a beautiful mound site. Inside it is this incredible chamber with these beautiful um, sort of uh, zigzag carvings and spiral carvings. And in, on December the 11th, 1950, in the island Sentinel, huge, huge skeletons were said to have been found. 
um, which absolutely stunned the, the, the people involved in this. There were two or three newspaper reports. It caused a bit of a sensation, and it just suggests that the original builders of the megalithic sites in Ireland could well have been giants. Next. This is the famous um, uh, gi giant from Ireland, uh, which was almost mummified. It was discovered in a uh, peat bog. Uh, in County Antrim, and it was said to be 12 foot 2 inches tall, and the girth of the chest was 6 foot 6 inches. The length of one arm was 4 foot 6 inches. And it, was, it actually got driven around as on display in Dublin, Liverpool, and Manchester. What happened to it at the end, though, we don't know. He, he, some guy didn't pay his bill or his train fare or something, and it disappeared, and no one knows what happened to it. This um, shows you one from Dysart and Louth. Uh, this is really a skull, which is um, 18 inches from the crown to the chin. And this is similar to Frank here. This is similar to like Frank's size. You can see the size of his skull next to mine. It's pretty, pretty big. And um, they claimed it was, must have been from a person who originally stood 12, uh, sorry, 10 feet tall. So I'm just going to whip through some more countries around Europe now and going into the Middle East. This is uh, an area called Philae Island. This was a discovery in 1881, 16 miles below Najar Defard. A row of tombs and some, a remarkable prehistoric race of giants were uncovered. Um, some measure 7 feet and 8 inches in length and the largest 11 feet 1 inch. Now this was a matter-of-fact account. This was part of an archaeological dig, uh, one of the early, earlier, more like an antiquarian dig, in 1881 by Professor Timmerman. So this is utterly mind-blowing. Could, could this be for real? It could well be. Because further north of there, um, just north of Cairo towards uh, Ale the area of Alexandria, um, this was found. This is a very, very strange thing. You may have seen this already. This has been all over the internet by a researcher called Gregor Spory. He presented a number of photos uh, a few years ago, and he had to pay a few hundred uh, dollars to see this. But this was in a private collection of a former, very old grave robber uh, or tomb raider, if you like. Um, and this was this was X-rayed. It was scanned. This was a real finger. This was from a mummified person. And either this person had extremely large hands uh, and was a freak, or he was actually a giant, and he would have stood something like fifteen to sixteen feet tall. If we just head further around the Middle East area, go slightly northeast, here we get into the biblical references. Now, this gets crazy when you start looking into this. I mean, I'm not going to go through all these, but these are just some examples of, of what we find in the Bible. We have the classic stories of the watchers and human women mating and creating the Nephilim. And these terrorized um, people, they became cannibals, which is something we also find in North America still in, in some, of the, uh, some of the accounts we've got in the book. We have um, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Rephaim, and many others. Here's just some examples. Even in Italy, I mean, I'm just going through some countries here. I'm just going to give you some accounts just to sort of blow your mind. With the, this is a genuine worldwide phenomenon. Here's just one example here. Uh, this is a woman, seven foot tall, was found on the left there. Um, and also on the right, near Turin, Italy, seven skeletons were discovered over seven foot tall. This is from 1838 in Gigenti, which is a kind of reference to giants, the name itself. Um, and this was reported originally in 1807 when they dug down into this cavern and found <clears throat> skeleton of an extremely tall giant, said to be 11 feet, 4 inches in length. However, this was Italian measure, not English measure. The English measure would have been 10 foot, 5 feet, just to clear that up. And this just shows you uh, a close-up of the original illustration. They also found hieroglyphics there carved on these stones, and if you look, a kind of cleanly put-together wall. Because all over this part of Italy, all along the west coast, we have very powerful megalithic sites, these polygonal walls, perfectly cut, just like you find in Peru. So this is said to have been built by the early giants. This is from um, <clears throat> a place called Castle Note in France uh, from 1892. This was the original port, this report. This came out on October the 3rd of that year. But previously, this had been noted by uh, researchers there um, in 1890. Uh, bones of enormous size, double the ordinary, in fact, were found in the tumulus of Castle Now. Uh, they've been examined by Professor Keener, a uh, very tall race, nevertheless finds the abnormal, or, more, 
abnormality in dimensions and of morbid growth. If we actually look at the bones, and they've been measured, they've been analysed uh, by various professors, uh, it would have been 3.5 metres tall, which is 11 foot 6 inches. Now this, we're finding sort of very high range of giants here. This is the higher range of what we're, we're dealing with in our research. Uh, she's almost twice the height of me. Um, and they tested several of the bones from the skeleton. All of them are of that size. So this just shows you um, the sheer size of what we're dealing with here. Then this further research has been done by a gentleman, a good friend of ours called Micah Ewers, who lives on the west coast of America. And he's been analysing this, and he believes this is a genuine account. And we, and we know one of the bones is on display in France. We're going to try and investigate that this summer. And just to put it in context, there's many other accounts in France. Here's just a few examples. Uh, the, the, there's too many to mention here. Uh, there, if the one at the bottom in the middle there is 10 and 15 feet in height, so we're looking at extremely tall skeletons. On the right, seven-foot skeletons were found, and so on and so forth. We have Tenerife. This is an island where some very interesting um, volcanic pyramids have been, volcanic stone pyramids have been found. Um, but this is actually the work of um, Thor Heridel. He actually did some research here. And these are those so-called Guanches, and these are supposed to be giants. And there's been some recent research done on one of the mummies found there. who was It was oversized, uh, which just came out a few weeks ago. Uh, I haven't found a good photo of that yet, because I think the one I saw was photoshopped and exaggerated somewhat. But there's a 14-foot high skeleton and 80 teeth in the mouth which would suggest he had double rows of teeth a phenomenon we'll be discussing very soon even in turkey uh not too far from this polygonal wall site again like we find in italy we find in peru we find in egypt um a seven foot skeleton was found and he, he was the bodyguard of an ancient hittite princess sardinia there's multiple accounts of giants here all the sites there are said to be built by giants. There's been bones, skeletons found. The account we've got here on the right is one that was eight feet tall. We're going to be going here this summer, me and my girlfriend. We're going to go and check this out. I'm obsessed by this place. I still haven't been there yet. My good friend James Swagger and Maria Wheatley have been doing some research over there. So hopefully we're going to get there, see if we can find some bones. Even if we jump over to Japan, we find, again, more polygonal walls. We find dolmens. And again, we find giants. There's a connection here, clearly. Um, Perfect teeth, and this is something we find in the North American giants. And again, seven foot high giants have been found. Now this, whoever made this footprint, is obviously uh, larger than seven foot tall. And this is almost four to five feet long. And this is on the um, uh, in South Africa. That's my good, good friend Michael Tellinger, which I think has been over to the Nexus conference. And myself, we visited there a couple of years ago. And I could not believe what we saw there. Geologists claim it's natural. It just doesn't look natural. It looks strangely real because you even have the bit on the uh, the toe overlap thing. So when your foot goes in, you pull it out of mud. You have this overlap. It happens. And this is actually what's in this. And that's granite. So technically that can't happen. But it's worth noting as an anomaly. And here we find even in near Johannesburg, a 10 foot tall giant was discovered not far from the area. So yet more examples uh, to deal with. Even if we ju jump over to uh, Peru, a uh, skeleton of a human who must have been eight feet tall. This is uh, in the Amazon area of Peru. More examples here, this time living giants in the jungle back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, that's said to be red hair and hunchbacks. So what go has been going on in the Amazon, we don't know, but there are many, many accounts, legends, and stories of giants. And, of course, we have the legends of Tiwanaku, where the great god Viracocha, was said to have employed or created giants out of the mud, out of the stone, to build Tiwanaku and all the megalithic sites along the great path of Viracocha. But then they got out of hand, they became cannibals, they terrorised people, and they had to create a flood to destroy them. And this is almost the exact same story we find in the Bible with the Nephilim. And so the connections here, utterly astonishing. So even in Australia, we have very, very interesting examples here. Now, this isn't an actual giant. This is a landscape giant, which is actually a piece of art, but I thought it was a nice picture to show. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of accounts Jim and I pulled out of the archives just recently just uh, for this lecture. This is from the 30th of January, 1926. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> now, this is uh, a giant seven feet in high, was said to have been discovered in Tasmania. This is very uh, 
badly. It's not a good quality photo, but this is from 1929 and 1931. It was also reported. For apparently this one, this seven-foot giant found in Port Broughton or Broughton, ended up in the Adelaide Museum. So if anyone's out there from Adelaide, please go and look and ask them in the museum and get back to me. And if you find a giant bone or skeleton, let me know. I'd really appreciate that because uh, I can't get over there myself, unfortunately, for a little while. Um, but we might be doing some research with Duncan in the near future, so who knows. This is obviously the famous and wonderful Rex Gilroy. Um, showing some massive tools here. I, I just um, uh, I was in touch with him when I was over there last time, but I didn't get a chance to meet him. Uh, and I mentioned my research, and he was kind of intrigued. But this is just some of the massive tools that have been found over there uh, that were discovered or at least collected by Rex Gilroy. This is a, a so-called fossilized tooth, uh, apparently found in the Winburdale River uh, near Bathurst, again, which is where many of the tools were found. Uh, which is would have been of a gentleman uh, between 10 to 12 feet tall. And further accounts from Bathurst and Rex Gilroy, uh, more huge teeth, uh, and even, um, you know, and other parts of the body really were found. But this one, he claims, would have been a person over 25 feet tall. So this is probably the record of what we've got so far, if, if, if this is genuine. Even at the Gympie area, I've, I've visited here to look at the so-called Gympie Pyramid up in Queensland. Uh, the farmer there, Keith Walker, uh, he said he's found a large back portion of a jaw, um, which would have been of a gentleman or lady standing 10 feet tall. So, again, more uh, circumstantial evidence in Australia. And then we have this very interesting skull uh, from Cow Swamp Skull from Victoria. Now, there, there were more than one of these, or several. This is one that caught my attention because it's got the same archaic features. It's got the brow ridge. It's got the powerful jaw and the high cheekbones, as well as the elongated head. Uh, and this is supposed to be 13,000 years old. And it's claimed that, you know, even in the original archaeological report, that it was a, a man about 40 years old of, and of large, powerful build, very thick cranial bones. Um, and is one of many that were found in that area, suggesting oversized human beings with very different features were living in that area. So this is um, the Megalong Valley in the Blue Mountains of uh, New South Wales. You may have heard of this already. Again, this is uh, uh, from Rex Gilroy. Uh, I think someone else discovered it and told him about it. Uh, seven inches across at the toes, uh, two feet in length. Again, if this is a human and not a Yowie or a Bigfoot, this would have been someone who would have been roughly 12 feet tall or even... 20 feet tall, uh, because other footprints have been found that suggest one's that big. Um, so Mulgoa, south of Pen Penrith in New South Wales. Again, more two foot long and seven inches across the toes. Uh, some were found uh, in red and sandstone beds. Um, and now it's like the owner must have been 17 feet tall. Again, we're looking at circumstantial evidence here, but the skulls we saw in the previous slides do suggest there's something going on here, and especially as, as what Duncan was saying earlier, where the Aborigines or Aborigines were, you know, telling the stories about these tribes of giants that were the very early inhabitants of Australia. If we jump over to um, New Zealand and Kiribati, we do find uh, there's many accounts of giants actually in New Zealand. I'm not going to get into those now because I want to focus on my research. We haven't researched properly there yet. Uh, but some six-toed giants have been found in these particular areas, which are much larger than what they should be. Um, and so the fact that six toes have been found on these giants is one of the genetic traits we find in North America, and we also find in the Bible. And this um, just shows you, this is from uh, Samuel 21, it's still another battle which took place at Gath. There was a huge man with six fingers, fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He was descended from Rapha when he taunted Israel. Jonathan, son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. So there you go. The giants were getting killed off. We have the evidence. And also, Tonga, uh, sorry, Anamadol, uh, we find uh, some very interesting ruins up there. Uh, we featured this on uh, part four of the Search for the Lost Giants TV show in episode four. And Anamadol was said to be constructed by the twin giant sorcerers. It was said to have built the site using levitation and their immense strength. And they were said to have existed some island in the Pacific, maybe Lemuria or Mu, 
Uh, and there are several historical accounts of giant skeletons being found. One of these is from the American Geographical Society in 1859. And uh, I'll just read some of this to you because this is very, very interesting. A narrow entrance has been opened at the top through which we descended and found ourselves in a dark cell eight feet deep and 11 feet by 10 feet in length. Um, the foreigners told us that the coal stones once formed a pavement on the floor of the vault, but within 10 or 15 years, they'd been torn up by visitors searching for relics. But in 1838, Captain Chaz, Captain Chaz, a coffin was found, um, and it took several people to uncover gigantic bones of human bones found within this site. Now, this, this, this got interesting because Jim's actual neighbour next is this guy called Al, and he actually featured on the show and discussed some legends and stories and some even some eyewitness accounts of people who saw the bones on the island. So now we move uh, to the southern tip of South America before we head into the America itself. Uh, this is a very, very interesting story with Patagonia. Um, it's very strange. There have been many accounts, many live giants have been reported there from the 1500s onwards. Um, Ferdinand Magellan, even Sir Francis Drake, uh, and various other Antonio Picafetti, um, various voyages. Magellan's voyage, one of them, for example, wrote about this. Uh, and, he, and he quotes saying, When he was before us, he began to marvel at us to be afraid. And he raised one finger upwards, believing that we came from heaven. And he was so tall that the tall of us thus only came up to his waist. So this is just one example, and you can see that in the photos here. Um, there are other accounts of 10-foot uh, skeletons being discovered, um, but even the women were very tall as well. And even in, in the next slide, uh, we can see other examples that were actually photographed in the early 1900s. Now, these were slightly further south. If you look on the map on the right, you can see Patagonia and, uh, and, and the Antarctic continent itself. All these islands in between were where giants have lived. Uh, and these are photographs taken by uh, Captain Cook in the early 1900s of actual um, giants. And these are at least seven foot tall, the shorter of what we find over there. So the fact is they may still exist down there in the Patagonian mountains, we really don't know. But it became like a sensation, a whole like, um, there was a giant frenzy throughout Europe at that time. People were getting really excited by it. More tra travellers would go down there and try and find them. They even tried to kidnap some of them and bring them back on their boat. Uh, and they did this. They actually kidnapped two of them or tricked them. They came on the boat, but then they died of like either seasickness or they didn't have the right food. Uh, why they didn't keep the skeletons, I don't know, but probably the rotting flesh of two giant human beings was enough to put them off before they could throw them overboard before they got back to Britain. Um, but anyway, so we, we, do, we do find examples in that part of the world, which is something I'm desperate to investigate myself. So now we're going to move over to North America. Now this, we're not just going to look at 10 accounts. These top, this is an article I did, Jim and I did for ancient-origins.net, where we were asked to put together an article of 10 of the most important, largest, going from 7 foot up to 18 foot tall, uh, that were found in North America. And I think this, I just wanted to show you this because it gives you kind of uh, a map, really, of what we're dealing with here in our research. The fact that over a thousand accounts have been found, you know, we found ourselves in North America. Jim's been doing most of the research on this. He's been going through all the records. Uh, we work with a uh, brilliant researcher called Ross Hamilton, who wrote the classic book, A Tradition of Giants. But we just got to a point uh, where once we'd reached 1,000 accounts of giants from newspapers, from town and county histories, from personal diaries of doctors and surgeons, even from the Smithsonian annual reports themselves. This is like the National Academic National Museum here. We kind of took notice there's something going on here. And when we started matching it with the legends, with the eyewitness accounts, um, and, and what was on display before 1990, before the NAGPRA Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was enforced, we knew there was a, a real phenomenon here, and uh, and we knew the legend. It wasn't just legends; it was an actual phenomenon. Next, this is a map put together by a brilliant researcher called Celia Hall. She's a good friend of ours. She helped us uh, put, the, put these uh, maps all around the world together. And this just this is uh, uh, we decided to show you this one. This isn't the latest one. This is the early one of about just a few hundred accounts because one with 
a thousand accounts on it, you can't see America. It, it becomes a blur. Uh, and so we thought we'd better show you this. But this just gives you an example of the location of them. And you can see the real hub is right in the Ohio spot there. You see that? It just gets crazy. It turns into like shadows there. And that's like the, that's like the sort of giant center. That's like the giantology center. That's where we believe it was the origin point or, or the real kind of where the real breeding program really happened. And that's where the hub is. And, uh, and this just shows you, but almost every state, apart from this strip um, down in the sort of plains area, um, on the slightly to the left of the middle in the map, we find giants. Every, every state we've found examples, even on the California Channel Islands off the coast, even off the islands like Martha's Vineyard off the New England coast, right down into Florida, even into the Bahamas, into Mexico, into Canada, everywhere. But this is the giant center. And it's interesting because if we jump back to the story of Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, from the history of the kings of Britain in 1150 AD, he says something quite kind of charming and interesting, which made me think he was talking about America. Now, it could be speculation. It could be like me wanting it to fit, but I'll read this to you anyway. But beyond the realms of Gaul, beneath the sunset, lieth an island, girt about by ocean, guarded by ocean, erst the haunt of giants. And was he talking about Ireland or was he talking about America? Who knows? Next. Now, this is a picture of Sir Francis Drake uh, in 1578, and he made contact with the Patagonians and the Taluchi tribe at the very south tip, uh, as we saw already, in Patagonia. But in his book, which was put together by his nephew um, in The World Encompass, which came out in 1628, next, he um, found that not only were the Patagonian giants quite remarkable. This just shows you his voyage. I don't know if you can see this. He comes over from England, goes around the southern tip of the Americas and back up the coast all the way to North America and across around the world. He did a whole circumnavigation of the globe. Um, but he actually met some of these giants in Patagonia. But most interestingly, he also met some in North America when he was up. He pulled into San Francisco Bay or near there. We're not sure exactly where it was from his description. I didn't have a name there. And he met a tribe up there who were quite a disorganized tribe, but they were, some of the chiefs were extremely tall. Um, and this kind of intrigued him. They had to fix their boats. They had to spend a few months there in the summer of, uh, of that year. And they tried to get him to become king because they were so disorganized, and he was such a, a gentleman and organized. But he, but he kind of refused, but went along with it in a way. Uh, but he describes them as being over seven foot tall and powerful human beings. So we have Sir Francis Drake talking about them from Patagonia and up in San Francisco, which is fascinating because no one mentions that. You talk to anyone about Sir Francis Drake, nothing. Okay, so this is just one of the little things we researched when looking through his diaries. This is um, Alonso Alvarez de Pineda, and in 1519, he was one of the Spanish explorers who made his way. Um, again, he was involved in seeing um, some of the Patagonian giants, but he made his way up to... Um, Amer over to America, and they went up into the Gulf of Mexico and up the Mississippi River, and they saw settlements and villages inhabited by local giants, not far from where the river empties into the Gulf of Mexico. There he found a large town on both sides of its banks for a distance of six, six, leaves, six leagues up its course, so 40 native villages. And what's really interesting is he found not only a race of giants, also a race of pygmies and they were living together and hanging out together and he couldn't believe it and so we have these stories of the big people and the little people in the same area we find this in other parts of the world it's one of these phenomenon uh, that jim and i become very interested in uh pineda he actually without realizing when he sailed back around the gulf coast he, f he sailed past some huge texas indians um which were reported by other people um and he described uh, them as being very tall and well-formed, with unusually coarse hair, and they were cannibals. So this is something we keep coming across as we go through North America stories. So this is just a highlight of this, which kind of it made me very interested because they, some of the uh, Spanish explorers went over to the Caribbean, and this, <laughs> this, this blew my mind when I read this. This was um, written by historian Peter Marta um, about... Uh, and it was told by a native who was Christianized and taken to Spain. And I'll just read this to you because it's so funny, so interesting. The report ran that the natives were white and their king and queen giant, whose bones, while babies, had been softened with an ointment of strange herbs, then kneaded and stretched like wax by masters of the art. 
leaving the poor objects of their magic half dead. Until after repeated manipulations, they finally attained their great size. So if that's how giants become giants, that is quite amazing. We have more Spanish explorers. We have a whole chapter in the book called Early Explorers, uh, where we talk about all the different eyewitness accounts of live giants in North America. And we, we talk about Patagonia as well. Uh, too many to mention here, but this just shows you a map of where the um, explorers travel to. Uh, we have De Soto, Hernan De Soto, Coronado, Cabeza de Vaca, and all of them witness live giants. And actually, De Soto got into battles with giants that became this crazy long story about Tuscaloosa and a great war that happened. And Tuscaloosa and his son were over eight feet tall, and this is recorded in the, on the historical record, and we feature this in detail in the book. Even Captain John Smith in the early 1600s um, talked about, when he was mapping uh, Virginia and the area, he talks about giants that he witnessed. Uh, they measure, I quote, they measured the calf of the largest man's leg and found three quarters of a yard about. The rest of his limbs were in proportion so that he seemed as tall as the most goodly personage they had ever beheld. His arrows were five quarters long, which means much bigger, headed with the splinters of white crystal-like stone. And they just basically were describing giants. If you look at this gentleman on the top right here, uh, the, the text underneath it say this is giant-like. Um, so you can actually, it's actually described as a giant of the gentleman he was describing. Such Gawanox are a giant people and thus are tired. And here we have a map. If we jump over to New England, this just shows you, um, this is obviously somewhere where Jim, Jim lives up here in Massachusetts. Uh, this just shows you where the tribal boundaries uh, around the 1600s of this area. But many of these were giants, even on uh, Martha's Vineyard there. And these skulls mark where we found giant skeletons have, have been reported um, all over the place, right near Jim himself in Deerfield, up on the top left there. He lives in a place called Asheville, very close to there. And even in his local museum, he found evidence of an eight-foot giant that once existed there. Um, all over New England, something I've been passionate about. I've been researching the hundreds of megalithic sites that are in New England. And, of course, giants are being found there too. This is the small island off uh, the southeast coast. This is uh, from Martha's Vineyard. Um, and this dolmen here uh, was overlooking the ocean in a town called Chilmark, close to where a giant was discovered. And so these dolmens are always associated with the giants. We have another hanging rock here. It's called Phaeton Rock or Cannon Rock. Uh, and again, just not far from here, at a place called Fish Marsh, uh, another eight-foot giant was discovered. And this is a, a carefully placed boulder. This is not by chance. There's three stones here. You can't really see them because they put wood around it to stop them falling on the house below. But we visited here a couple of years ago, and, uh, and it's for real. It's a very interesting site. This is um, Pasacone. This is, he was a Bashaba. He's like basically a chief of chiefs of uh, the Penacook tribe. Um, and he was basically based around, you know, between Massachusetts, New Hampshire, that kind of area. And he was a magician. He was like a, a priest. He was also a shaman and a sorcerer. And he was had incredible powers, which we go into great detail in the book. He was said to be almost eight feet tall. Um, so this, I believe, uh, and this was, this was, he was alive in the 1600s. And he lived to over 100 years old. This is something we find with many of these accounts and even in the Bible that they had a very, very long lifespan, extremely long. And just next to where he was found, uh, we find a stone circle. Now, this is very, this is right on the edge of their reservation, a place called Lowell in Massachusetts. Um, it was recorded in 1659 as being there, as being there. So we know it's ancient, we know it's old, at least that old. Uh, and it could well have been built by the giant chief, um, Pascone Way, who knows? Uh, we visited this site. There's also a burial chamber near here as well, with the beehive chamber next, which you can see in this image here. And so this uh, does suggest that megalithic construction was taking place with the, these tribes, with these giant leaders. So again, we're just having a quick look at the map here. We're going to jump down to Connecticut now on the bottom left. We have uh, this account. This is from the prestigious Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. Interestingly, that's where the skull and bones um, uh, the Skull and Bone Society was formed. Uh, so I wonder if that's got anything to do with the giant skulls and bones they were finding. Uh, again, this, this uh, on a smaller scale, six feet, eight inches tall here, but some unusual um, 
uh, artifacts were found with an unrecognisable type of metal. This is in Hartford, Connecticut, just up the Connecticut River. They all seem to be located around major riverways. This is from 1901. Uh, curious copper and stone implements and crude ornaments. The thigh bone of the giant skeleton is twice as that large as that of an ordinary man. So we're talking 10 to 12 feet tall here. Uh, but we know accounts have been found all along the Connecticut River in a place called Gill, Northfield, Deerfield, Hadley, Montague, and so on and so forth. So we know even in New England, I mean, none of this has been reported until Jim, and Jim put his re research cap on and found that his local area had these giants. This is the petrified giant, which was dug up in 1897. Uh, eight feet long, uh, Italian laborers dug this up and they could not believe what they found. Here's actually uh, an illustration of it. And so even in New Haven, uh, another one in New Haven, Connecticut, we do find this. So this just shows you, um, uh, we, we did some Photoshop on this just to bring out the image a bit tighter because uh, the one on the TV show didn't come out that well. But look, if you look here, they've got some, not only do they have antennas, uh, that's a whole other story, ancient aliens, whatever you want to call it. But the one on the bottom right here kind of grabbed our attention because this is clearly it's larger than the others. And look, look what it's sort of representing with the teeth. It's a very strange look. So we, we think this could be representing the actual description we have uh, of the skeleton of the skull, which shows extra rows of teeth, which is a, something we're going to get into shortly. But you look at some other ones here, they look like horns. Now, uh, it, it gets weirder, honestly. We do a whole segment in the book about horned skull giants. And this is it's very strange, but this is real. There's some real discoveries here. There's ones that have got tails. There's uh, I mentioned the pygmies already, pygmies living with the giants. Uh, there's other ones with like, such outrageously large jaws, often and even three rows of teeth in one account from the Smithsonian. So it, it gets crazy. We'll talk about that shortly. So if we just uh, shift over, I'm just going to do a quick scan across a couple of parts of America, looking at a couple of accounts. We've moved slightly uh, west, going into New York State and Pennsylvania. New York State goes a lot further west than most people realize. Uh, here's a place called Onondaga Park in Syracuse. 28-pound uh, weight sledgehammers were discovered here. Now, 9 pounds is the maximum you can carry, you can use now as a sledgehammer. Large swords were found, and there's evidence of a great battle that took place in this area. Uh, in 1849, this area as well... Um, it's from the diary of Victor Hopkins Clark, um, and he talks about an area called the Salt Springs Reservation, where it was divided up in 1794. A feud ensued, and the superbly named Handsome Harry was the last native to fall. He was the, and basically what they found was they found several skeletons were found, one of extraordinary size. The skull was comparatively large, and the jaws were surrounded with a full set of double teeth all around. They were perfectly sound covered with beautiful enamel and the most perfect whiteness. Now, this is a clear description of double rows of teeth in both jaws, something that's caused massive controversy. We've actually got anthropologists and academics and Jason Colavito, skeptics and all this stuff, really attacking us over this, claiming, oh, no, they're just describing single sets of teeth. That's just what they called them then. And we're like, really? Uh, so this is one of the genetic traits of the giants. We have more examples here from this area. We're going to get into the double rows of teeth thing very soon. We'll get into more detail about that. But this account has an immense, uh, not only was he of immense size, uh, he was furnished with a double row of teeth in both jaws. This is from Jefferson County in New York. Oh, sorry, this one, sorry, I forgot to say next. This one was the Jefferson County one I was just talking about with a man of colossal size with double rows of teeth uh, and various other uh, found in that area. But often, as you can see in the bottom part here, uh, so great has been the length of time since these bones have been covered. They fell to pieces very soon after being exposed to the air. And this is something that keeps happening. Whether this is an excuse and it's a hoax, we don't know. But this does happen with very ancient remains. So they, these could be much older than people realize. Again, from the same book, um, under the roots of a large maple tree, we dug up the bones of a man of great stature and furnished with entire rows of double teeth yet again. And we have this account as well. This actually was a gentleman who witnessed uh, some giant skeletons being dug up when he was a child in 1876. And he remembered that he took the measurements, he remembered the measurements and created these wooden structures of these giants when he was an older man just to sort of emphasize what was going on in this area. And we talked to the grandson, or uh, sorry, the granddaughter of this gentleman who verified the account. So, again, another interesting lead. This is uh, the Ohio, Ohio area, um, 
And uh, this is where most of the accounts come from. This is like we have, we have so many accounts. We have like something like 200 accounts from Ohio itself. And we only have the 250 total in the book, you know, uh, spread out across the country. So this is this is the hub. This is the area. This area and then slightly to the right of there, we have West Virginia as well. But let's look at Serpent Mound to start with. This is the most famous earthwork in the country. This is the most famous site in the country, really. This is um, it's 1,370 feet long. It's located near a town called Peebo, Peebles. Uh, it's also on the edge of this great meteor impact crater. So you get these gravitational, magnetic, and other energetic phenomena happening there. Uh, earth lights happen there, etc., uh, etc. Et now, just this mound, you can't really see it here, just at the very bottom of the tail, uh, a bit further below, right on the bottom edge of the screen, is where some large skeletons were uncovered, uh, including the one in the next slide. And this shows you a seven-foot skeleton that was uncovered. Uh, this was uh, on a postcard, of all things. Uh, and my good friend and researcher, Jeffrey Wilson, managed to get a copy of this. And he uh, and actually, the original, what we thought was, is that it was seven-foot, as we see now. It's been cut off at the, the knees. I don't know why they do that, the archaeologists. But you can see this type of skull. It's a very powerful jaw rounded scar it's not classic native american looking this is something we'll explore as we uh, reach uh, get further into the talk but this is a seven foot example found at serpent now there are other examples but professor putnam um really was cagey about calling them giants it wasn't it wasn't a good thing back then academia the smithsonian there were agendas in place and they were covering up the giants we'll explain why very soon if we head slightly further southwest from there uh, we find marietta earthworks these are a beautiful complex of mounds with moats and also uh, some very square uh, earthworks stretching around a very large area up to 1,500 feet wide with step pyramids made of earth as well very similar to what we find in Mexico here's a photo of me uh, looking daft uh, from a trip there a couple of years ago uh, this is Marietta now this is actually strangely they built a graveyard around this burial mound which is something they tend to do this just shows you a plan of the whole site and you can see the mound on the bottom right there heading out into the large square enclosures and then the larger enclosure you can see what looks like mini pyramids with steps going up. So this is something that uh, has caused much controversy. But in 1901, in, uh, in uh, the Fastoria Review in July the 25th, a taller than average skeleton was discovered within the earthworks. This, the bones were remarkably well preserved, uh, are of abnormal size, and I was close to be reckoned the individual must have measured at least seven feet in height. So again, another mound builder giant. This is an interesting one. This is something we just found just before we published the book. We just did a bit of research on this. Uh, but this is actually in Kentucky from 1903, and it was 60 feet below ground under a mound. So this, this, this is something that I've been questioning for a while, is the fact that they, when, before they build the mounds, they, they create a huge burial chamber deep within the earth, and then they build the mound on top. So it's an extremely large structure if you go in from the bottom to the top, much like the underground areas of the Pyramids of Giza, I guess. But the strange thing about this one, they found a jar buried with this eight-foot giant um, and that had some corn nibs in it that had been preserved. And so when they, they dug it out, they did a kind of antiquarian excavation on it and so forth, they planted the crop, the corn and got an incredible yield from it and it was it was a type of cr uh, corn they'd never known before so the mound builders knew about agriculture however old this was we don't know but an eight and a half foot giant having this kind of sophistication does open up a lot of questions that have not been addressed by american academia west virginia and virginia all the way over to um uh, the coast there this is a quite a hub of uh, sites as well. This is the famous Grave Creek Mound in Moundsville, uh, West Virginia. Not dissimilar to Silbury Hill, a bit shorter than Silbury Hill, but in 1838 um, some excavations took place that yielded two large skeletons. Uh, the female was wearing copper arm rings with ornaments, uh, said to be seven foot four inches tall and an eight foot tall male, plus the mention of a great jawbone discovered there as well. But also they discovered on the bottom right there this, this uh, Grave Creek tablet. Now this caused, has caused massive controversy. This is like, you know, double the width of your thumb. It's tiny. It's a tiny little thing. They have a copy in the museum. There's also a copy in the Smithsonian. Um, and when this was investigated, they realized it was like Semitic script or potentially Phoenician, Punic. 
basically it could have come from the Bible lands, it could be part of the Canaanite tradition of the Nephilim and so forth. So this this has really got people going. Uh, and it's disappeared now. It's gone missing, of course. It always, all the good stuff does. Um, but it's one of those mysteries that has never been answered. This is an actual giant that's on display, which I've, uh, I haven't got my, my own photograph. isn't as good as this one. Oh, no, that is my photograph on the right. I'm sorry, yes. I was looking at the wrong slide. That is my photograph on the right. I've made it black and white. It looks a bit cooler like that. But the one on the left shows you the, the height of it. This is actually in the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, seven foot six from northern Kentucky. And I looked into this, uh, I looked at the original records of this. It may well have acromegaly because it looks like it's got a, a sort of expanded chest area. But the jawbone and the eye sockets are very similar to what we find in the male builders um, sort of um, style respect, really. But the weird thing about this one is the fact that um, in the records it states that whoever displays this and purchases this must not reveal its origins. <laughs> so I found that really interesting. So I bet this came from a mound. We have various accounts here. Uh, this is at Chickasawba Mound. I visited here uh, a few months ago. Uh, many different things, many, many artifacts and bones. This was like open season, this place from 1870 onwards. A uh, gigantic statue and Herculean strength, some described. Uh, there was even a skeleton that was left on display, just left in the corner of this tent that went missing after a few months. I didn't know what to do with it. It was so big. It's a 13-acre site. Um, but even, you know, relatively recently, some giant skeletons were found when they were digging basements to build houses in the area. So I went up here. I tried to talk to some locals, but unfortunately, um, it wasn't the best time because... Um, it was uh, one of the holidays there in America. That's it. So this is interesting. This is just up in the northwest of uh, Arkansas, um, going over into Oklahoma. This is the Ozark Cave. We actually feature this in the TV show as well. But when they dug into these caves, they found skulls. And these are the photos um, of what must have been humans that were 10 feet tall. And this was published in a Rosicrucian publication. So we have the Masons. We have the Rosicrucians, we have the mystics all involved in this phenomenon from a very early date. This was 1913. In the TV show, uh, Search for the Lost Giants, Jim and his brother Bill investigated this account. They actually went flooding, uh, sorry, not flooding, diving into the flooded Beaver Lake. Um, that was flooded in 1960 to 66. Uh, but they, they, they tried to find these caves that in 1913 were obviously not flooded. Um, and so what they did find, though, was these sort of megalithic blocks and walls making up the entrance to the cave. So, uh, again, more evidence linking giants with rather large stones. And this just gives you an account um, of what was found there. Uh, at the depth of more than three feet, you found the remains of several giant human skeletons, including an almost perfect skull, which differed in many particulars from a modern specimen. When partly joined, the largest skeleton was almost 10 feet tall. And uh, rigging showed us hieroglyphs covering the palisades thought to be a thousand years old. So the hieroglyphs down here as well. Oklahoma, I'm just throwing some examples in here. It's a very interesting site here next called uh, Spyro Mound. Uh, or the main mound there is called Craig Mound. It's a series of what looks like four mounds joined together. I visited here again a few months ago, had a good look around. No evidence of giants now. They've all been taken away. Um, but the Pecola Miner Company were employed to dig it, um, and they were digging it for relics, basically. And uh, it just shows you them, you know, proudly destroying the mound. Um, but numerous skeletons and skulls were found here. Among the treasured finds is a large femur, indicating its owner must have been about nine feet tall. Bones and skeletons of other human beings are of normal size. And this is interesting. This is something that we do find over and over again, is that the giant shaman or the tribal leader is buried with his people, you know, with his helpers, uh, with his family or whatever, but he is the giant. There's always an elite group of these giants. This is something we find over and over again, and this is also mentioned in the legends. Um, he was over seven feet tall. His jaw would fit around my face. He was more or less in pieces. We had to put him together. You see, he was bound to be a giant. Here's just some of the artifacts, beautiful artifacts that were found within the burial. And speaking of artifacts, this is some giant axe heads that we've got access to, thanks to our good friend who's standing with me there, Brock Smith. One of them's 33 pounds, uh, another one is 14 and a half pounds, the average is nine pounds, the heaviest uh, a human can yield. These were found in a mound in, um, oh, I forget, Illinois, 
and um, and we we, had, we got access to these. We got photos of them. We did some experiments with them, and you have to be a big, strong giant to wield something like that. That's for sure. Oh, uh, sorry, I've just one behind there. Uh, the, what you see now is uh, what I just described: uh, the thirty-three pound and fourteen point five pound. Um, this is the one that we feature in the book. Again, this is a thirty-three pound ten ounce axe. Uh, this was found um, in Missouri. And now we're going to jump over and have a quick look at the Smithsonian. Now, this is a big problem because many of the bones, many of the giant skeletons were reported to the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian took them away. There's even accounts of giants being found by the Smithsonian themselves. Um, but generally what we find is, is that ones that were collected by the Smithsonian disappeared. And like they're never to be heard of again. Even people who had got them taken away, they wrote to the Smithsonian, oh, we don't know what you're talking about, even though they collect them officially. Next. This just shows you just a few more examples of what we're dealing with here, where the Smithsonian came in and took them away. And there was, a, there was an agenda forming um, at the time called Manifest Destiny, where it was like similar to what happened in Australia, I guess, where they classed the Native Americans as savages so they could take over their land and didn't want them to seem smart in any way. But when they kept finding 36-inch circumference skulls, geometric earthworks, and giant skeletons with amazing armor and arts and things like this, they realized they had to cover that side of things up to enable everyone to believe these Native Americans were savages, and therefore they could dominate them, put them on reservations, and steal their land. There's a lot more to it than that. We, we, we have the whole story in the Smithsonian Files chapter in the book. But this gentleman here next called Ailes Hadlika, Hadlitska, became uh, the main curator of physical anthropology at the Smithsonian in 1910. And he was involved in the eugenics movement, pre-Nazi, uh, this, that, and the other. And he became a real problem. And he covered everything up, denying giants even existed. Although, in the Smithsonian annual reports, we have 17 accounts written by their own professors. Uh, this is just a quick description of what I just mentioned. This is uh, the problem we find with manifest testing, but also the theory of evolution was coming into the time. And to find giant skulls and giant skeletons, it didn't fit in with the theory of evolution. It didn't fit in with manifest destiny. Therefore, it was deleted. Yet more accounts um, of giant skeletons and the Smithsonian involvement. There's Jim with the great Smithsonian annual reports that we went through piece by piece uh, for the book. And uh, and also thanks to Andrew Collins and Greg Little, they helped us uh, do the research on this. Double rows of teeth. These were reported by the Smithsonian. They've been reported all across the country. This is one of the most strange phenomena uh, we find relating to the giants. Utterly weird. We cannot understand it. But we do have it today. We have the supernumerary teeth phenomena. We have extra teeth. Um, and so on and so forth. The one on the right, a reconstruction we did for the TV show. We have a whole chapter devoted to this, Double Rows of Teeth, next. Um, and this just shows you some examples where they're describing two rows of teeth in the front and the back jaw, the top and the lower jaw. Uh, here we have like one of the skulls had two rows of teeth. And we even find horn skulls. And this, unfortunately, we think is a fake, but we have several horn skull accounts throughout the Americas. Um, this was supposed to have been found in 1916 in Pennsylvania. But what we do find, not only do we get double rows of teeth, we have horned skulls, but we have very elongated skulls. And all these skulls, the illustrations, are from um, um, northwest of, of North America. The bottom the bottom left there is actually from Peru, uh, sorry, from Bolivia, a place called Pumapunku, which is a famous megalithic site. That actually got stolen, that skull. That was on display. That was found recently, the one on the bottom left, and it got stolen just recently. Luckily, we managed to see it before it got stolen. But the ones on the, the other ones are from North America, and these are the Flathead and the Chinook Indians. We find similar skulls on the California Channel Islands. We find double rows of teeth here as well. This is one of the hubs of the giants. Hundreds of discoveries have been found here, and the dating of this area goes back 40,000 years of human occupation. The story is very controversial uh, with amateur archaeologist Ralph Glidden, but in 1913, uh, a German naturalist got the story going with the first giant skeleton discovery on the island. Here just shows you the ones we feature in the book in this part of California. And this is Dr. A.W. Furstenen, and he found an eight-foot-tall skeleton back in 1913. This was 
later researched by archaeologist, amateur archaeologist Ralph Clidden, and he collected a total of 3,781 skeletons on the Channel Islands between 1919 and 1930. He worked for the Hay Foundation in New York and claimed skeletons ranging between 7 feet and 9 foot 2. On the top right there, we have Jim and Bill Vieira going to the island and looking through the records uh, to see what else we could find there. And this uh, just shows you an image of a crouched skeleton with an elongated skull. This was in the records on that island. And these are further skeletons of giant stature with elongated skulls that were found on Catalina Island that were photographed live uh, by Jim and Bill for the TV show and for the book. Here's some research done by a gentleman called L.A. Mazzulli, and he's kind of done some analysis on some of the photos found uh, that Jim and Bill looked at and found that he believes the skeleton on the bottom there must be 8 foot 6 inches tall. So Nicholas Island, uh, we find yet more examples. Some were almost giants. Um, the jaw or the skulls could fit over the head of an ordinary man. Skulls with double rows of teeth, great caves. Again, this is um, uh, in one of the Channel Islands or various Channel Islands. We even have photos here from 1959 on Santa Barbara Island from 7,070 years. No, sorry, Santa Rosa Island. Uh, and this is a gentleman called Phil Orr. And they found some extremely ancient remains here, going 10 to 14,000 years old. And even if we jump over into Nevada, and California, and Utah, and we head further south, we find yet more examples. Lovelock Cave in Nevada, the redhead cannibal giants. We do a whole segment in the book about this. We go back at least 6,000 years. They used to terrorize the locals, and eventually, they used to eat the locals, they were cannibals. And eventually the Paiuti tribe defeated them by burning them in their cave. He just shows you some of the skulls that were found in the area, showing their robustness and power. And if we just head south, we're just going to finish up in a moment. I just want to give you a quick outline, um, just a couple of minutes, of what we're looking at here and where these people may have come from. We, we find giant skeletons down in Sonora. But also recently, these were discovered by uh, various people, um, uh, in the 1930s, but more recently, these elongated skulls were found in a very close area to where the giants were discovered. So we're finding a mix between the elongated skull people and the giants starting to come together. This is something that we see in Australia, we've seen around the world, and we think it's partly a genetic trait. You do get elongated type skulls, but also it's tradition of the elite and the shamans and the priesthoods to maintain through their generation as they noticed as such. Where they come from is a whole different matter. This is something we can't go into too much now, but uh, the origins of the tall ones has been under scrutiny for a very long time. We look at the Denisovans who came from Siberia because the teeth they found, you can see on the left here, were twice the chewing surface of a normal human being. They had a very large finger bone that was found. On the top right there, we have the Hobo, Homo hybridigensis from South Africa and Europe which were potentially twice the size of humans. These go back at least 100,000 years. And on the bottom right there, we have Cro-Magnon Man, who was the forerunner in Europe of the Europeans. But it's now thought, and through the research we've been doing, and uh, various other research, like um, Dr. Goodman and so forth, that the Cro-Magnon Man may have been in existence in North America before it was in Europe. So they could have originated in America, or could it be part of a whole migration happening through the Americas, from Australasia. Uh, we've seen Cro-Magnon skulls earlier in Australia, going back, what, you know, 13,000 years, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. This just shows you the, the movement from the red to the yellow to the green of the Denisovans, from the Hobo, Homo Hobo Degensis, who were actually forerunners of the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. The Denisovans then came down and came through uh, Asia and Australasia, probably made their way over to America as DNA, has been found in North American tribes. So we know there's a connection here. We know that the Denisovans are much larger than normal, potentially. This just shows you the teeth, tooth size we're dealing with here. Uh, a normal tooth and a Denisovan tooth. So there's something going on here. And Andrew Collins did some brilliant research on this as well. This just shows you a close-up of the Homo hobodigensis thigh bone, fossilized, uh, analyzed by Sir Francis, uh, Professor Francis Thackeray at the University of South Africa. Claimed they were seven foot tall. There's a archaeologist called Lee Berger, who claims they're seven feet tall, but this, we got on camera, Michael Tellinger filmed this guy, uh, Francis Thackeray, claiming this is twice the size 
of a normal human being. So they were, could have been 10 to 12 feet tall. And these were the forerunners, the Denisovans, who, uh, whose DNA ended up in North America. So there could easily be connections there. It shows you a close-up of how tall Cro-Magnon Man used to get. It used to be routinely over seven feet tall. And we know that the megafauna lived at the same time as the giants. And they died off 12,000 years ago. We know this because many of the legends state this. And there is archaeological evidence now coming out putting humans on the map in North America at that time. And even Edgar Casey was coming to a close here. Great mystic. I'm sure many of you know who he is. Um, talked about giants from Atlantis. He talked about the mound builders of America. Um, and he wrote that there were many different sizes and types of humans, from midgets to giants, as we saw already. Um, there were giants in the earth in those days, men as tall, 10 or 12 feet in stature, and well-proportioned throughout, which is something we find in the North American giants. They're well-proportioned, and they're, they're not got acromegaly, they're not got gigantism or anything like that. They're natural humans who have just got these genetic uh, positives, which we don't have anymore. And so this is something that uh, needs to be looked at. Also, the mystic Rudolf Steiner talked about giants as well, as did H.P. Uh, Helena Plavatsky, um, and various other mystics. And this is something that you know, Jim is very interested in, and it gives another dimension to where these giants could have really come from. Was it Atlantis? Was it Lemuria? Is it lost land masses? Or is it even something more mysterious? But we get into this in the final chapter, and we, we take a look at the migrations, the possibilities, the origins, really far out theories as well. We don't mention aliens too much, but they probably should get a mention. But overall, um, you can't really take it all too seriously. And uh, this is just me and my uh, co-author, Jim Vieira, in his giant office in Asheville, Massachusetts. And um, thanks very much for your time, everybody.